Okay, so it's a pleasure to welcome everybody to the 2015 E.N.P. Howard Memorial Lecture. And this year is going to be given by David Bird, as I'll introduce you in a moment. But I do want to say a few words about Ian, who is this, uh, which is the memorial for him, a way that we can remember him a little bit. And I know many of the people in the audience haven't had the, the pleasure of actually meeting uh, Ian. He was a, a, a great scientist that was here in the, from the very early days of, uh, of York University and was the founder of the Centre for Vision Research that is now sponsoring this, uh, this meeting. Um, he was well known for his Keith Robinson type equipment. He built all these amazing pieces of equipment with incredible precision and ingenuity, many of which are around still today. And uh, I've taken Dave into the old tumbling room, for example, which is, which is something that he had, he had made. And the simplicity of the design is something that everybody notices. It's just it's so incredibly compelling to be in that sort of environment. And uh, so much better than computers and all these modern kind of things that we have today. Anyway, to, to introduce our, our speaker. So Dave was actually born in Zimbabwe. Uh, but he was only there for about five months or something, he tells me, so that doesn't, doesn't really count. And then he did his undergraduate stuff in uh, Australia uh, before doing his PhD in Cambridge under the uh, supervision of Fergus Campbell. And that's where I first met him because I was doing my PhD just down the, down the corridor there. And I always thought, even though it turns out now that he was in fact just a, uh, another graduate student, I always thought he was a postdoc because he had that sort of hair. <laughs> I think his hair might have been that colour all, all the time. And uh, one, of, one of the things that was happening at that time was that, uh, this is in the uh, late 70s or mid 70s, and he was an absolute whiz on computer programming. And in those days, computer programming was very different from what it is now. You had a big box with toggle switches on the front, and for each and every command, you had to toggle it in in octal. So your programming now is a sequence of these little toggle switches go, toggle switches go, for every single command in order to make the thing work. This is a master toggler. <laughs> he was able to do this stuff so quickly and, uh, and with so little errors, because errors were a big problem in those days. But the, the speed and ingenuity that he applied back in those days to the PDP-8, uh, he now applies to many aspects of, of science. He has, since those times, uh, become an expert in uh, all aspects of visual <coughs> perception and has some interesting contributions in which he thinks that time is compressed under certain situations and even space may be compressed. So very uh, uh, far-reaching ideas. Uh, since, since being in, in Cambridge, by the way, I should be back on the, on the CV, um, he had a few jobs in uh, Pisa and um, in Australia, and then ended up at the University of Rome, where he had a first position, and now he's presently the Professor of uh, Psychology in the University of Florence, even though he does most of his work, in fact, in, in Pisa, some of which is in collaboration with his uh, wife, who many of us know, uh, Concetta Moran, so she's also there in Pisa as well. So, I think I've said enough there. What I'm going to do now is to introduce you as still talking about cross sensory integration and calibration during development. So, this off. Okay, is this, is this working? Okay, thanks very much, Lawrence. Uh, thanks, firstly, for not making an introduction too long and embarrassing, and, uh, but also uh, for the invitation to come here. I'm, I'm certainly honoured, and particularly honoured, to speak uh, at a lecture uh, named after Ian Howard, who, apart from being the founder of this particular institution, was one of the greats, I think, in uh, not only vision research and perceptual research in general, but he did not restrict himself just to vision. As uh, Lawrence said, it took me through this tumbling room which had all sorts of implications of outside, outside vision. So, uh, today uh, I'm going to be talking about, if I can get this thing. I don't think that's going to advance the science. It doesn't have a thing. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the talk today, I think um, it divides roughly equally if I can get this make some light and have to do that. Ooh, turn it off. 
I wouldn't get why. Uh, roughly the four equal parts, I'm going to give a general background and then talk about um, the notions of uh, integration between senses. And for that, I'm going to use an example, which is uh, the interpretive effect. Then move on to development and then look at another aspect of cross sensory interaction, namely cross sensory calibration, and there looking also at some uh, clinical, clinical evidence. So, firstly, um, hmm, I'm not getting the hang of this thing. There we go. So, we're talking about the brain. We're talking about the brain. Now, you might think the brain, well, you're all students, of course, but I, 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 I or of, of neuroscience, I imagine this would be a more general lecture, so I've made it a little bit more general. So, if you look at a brain, uh, it looks fairly uniform. It looks like a ball of porridge, but of course it isn't. If you, if you look at it a little more closely, as uh, uh, Broman did uh, more than a century ago, you find that it's divided up into 52 distinct areas and the distinctions are made on the basis of the number of uh, cells, uh, the density of the cells and, and so on. And this division, I think, is still one of the ways of classifying the brain. It's still used today. It's not the only way, but it's one of the ways that we use to uh, define what the areas are. But of course, an anatomical uh, distinction of the brain does not tell us that these different parts are doing different jobs. For that, we need some sort of uh, functional analysis. And for the functional analysis, uh, I think, owes uh, its roots to these three gentlemen, who possibly many people here would not recognize as neuroscientists, uh, and that's because they're not. Uh, Whitworth invented the rifle, uh, a, a rifle in one to seven ratio of the rifle, which uh, worked particularly well, and the other two uh, improved the bullet. So essentially it was packing a much larger charge and a smaller size bullet. And this resulted in a monotonic increase in the muscle velocity, uh, sort of peaking around about the times of the First World War and, and the Japanese Russian War. And the result of this, of course, was that uh, the bullets tend to pass through the head and firstly didn't kill the people so often, secondly tended to make more circumcised uh, damages, uh, damage. And using this, uh, people were able to reconstruct exactly what the visual areas were doing, what the areas were doing. I think most notable was Sir Gordon Holmes. He was a physician in the, in the British Army. And he made many, many, many reconstructions of veterans who had been uh, brain damaged. A less known person, uh, a Japanese uh, in LA, was did a similar work with the uh, Japanese wars um, and came up with uh, a similar analysis, of, a very detailed analysis of, uh, of uh, cortical areas. His analysis is particularly interesting as far as the visual system is, is concerned. And interestingly, he published it in German because German was the going language. It was the most important uh, language at the time for neurology. Uh, and it was translated by a friend of mine, uh, uh, Manfred Farley. And you might wonder, well, why did Germany lose, lose its, lead, its lead in neurology after World War I? And I think at least part of the answer is in the design of the helmet. Now, the British designed their helmet with a neurologist in mind. They <laughs> left a large area, particularly the occipital cortex, uh, that could be studied using these, uh, these techniques. And, of course, the Germans, what were they thinking? <laughs> uh, these days, oh, I wish I could get the hang of this. These days, it's not necessary to fight wars, and of course we've given up fighting wars. I mean, we just do MRI studies. And I think one of the important things to know, this is my son, it's quite a long time ago, going into uh, an MRI scanner, um, that of course with MRI we can do far more detailed studies, but I think it's, fair, it's safe to say that they've largely confirmed the original work of Gordon Holmes and you know, and of course extended it because you have uh, uh, far more detailed techniques. But when you compare the technique of, of having the three-dimensional tomology, uh, tomography of knowing exactly uh, which bit you're looking at with trying to make a reconstruction from a bullet entry and entrance wound, I mean, I think uh, 
we have an easier time these days. So what's the conclusion that we can draw? Uh, the general conclusion, I think, is one in which we can call localization a function. I mean, all of these studies lead to the fact that the brain is not a generic organ. Uh, different bits of it do different things. Uh, in particular, the five senses are coded in different parts of, of, of the visual cortex. And this, I think, has led not only to a localization of function, but a localization of studying the functions. And, and this is people who study vision, study vision. People who study hearing, study hearing. And this is also reflected just in looking at the, at the journals that come out. They all tend to be specialized. We all tend to do specialized work. And this is not unreasonable. I mean, if you're trying to attack a very large problem like the brain, you break it down into its bits and, and you look at the bits. Um, and certainly that's what I did for, um, for the largest part of my career. Uh, but not all journals, not all journals are specialised in that way. There is one. Uh, the journal that has come out, well, uh, called Multisensory Research, the Journal of Multisensory Research, actually considers what happens, how do we combine this information uh, from the different senses. And of course this is necessary because the real world, uh, we don't just isolate the senses and we use the senses together to try and understand what's going on. Example of, of uh, picking up a cricket ball and, and you, know, you will feel it and you, and you will see it. Uh, a red Ferrari will be uh, making a noise and we can localise it by watching it or, 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 or listening to it. So uh, there is a reasonable question, uh, how do we combine this information? And one way to tackle that question, how you combine uh, this information is to ask, well, what happens when the information you're getting is conflictual? And I'm going to, for the second part of the talk, talk about an example where the information you're getting is conflictual, and it's called the ventriloquist effect. Um, the ventriloquism is an example where the brain is fooled about the source of the sound because uh, it actually comes from the ventriloquist, of course, but it appears to come from, uh, from the puppet. So, you don't actually have to go to a, to a ventriloquist show to experience a ventriloquist effect. I mean, it, it happens just watching television, particularly the old-fashioned television with a diffuse sound source. Uh, the sound doesn't seem to come from the speakers wherever you put them. It seems to come from the actors on, on the television. And, and that is sort of a, a similar example. It's a, a phenomenon which has been studied for a long time, but also goes back even further from uh, before uh, the scientific inquiry, and there have been many, many explanations. The first one, I think, is a rather good explanation, uh, that it's magic. And it was indeed used by the oracles of Delphi uh, and, uh, and uh, various uh, sort of shoddy circumstances, typically to people to part with their money and so forth. But, what I find interesting is when uh, science started, uh, essentially after Isaac Newton in the 18th century, that the explanations were not about how we perceive the ventriloquist noise coming from the, uh, from the puppet, but assuming that it must be in the signal, assuming that it must be a physical explanation. So somehow the ventriloquist throw the voice, throw the sound. Now, we know that's impossible. You cannot by any tricks of the world, throw a sound wave so it appears to come from another place. That just doesn't work that way. Uh, they didn't know that. But what I find interesting is the assumption that if we perceive it that way, then it must be that way. I mean, we're very reluctant to uh, consider that it could be our brains at fault. I mean, we're, it's in the expressions. I heard it with my own ears. I, I saw it with my own eyes. I mean, as if, as if these instruments were infallible. Um, and then in the 80s, uh, I, I think the explanations did become <coughs> perceptual. And uh, they were along the lines of, well, vision is the dominant sense. So you see the puppet strips moving. You don't see the ventriloquist strips moving. So that dominates over the sound. Um, and that's probably not too far off the mark. But these days, the uh, explanation uh, in, in this millennium is that we can, it, it's a general explanation that we combine signals, all sorts of signals from within sensors and between sensors, in a way that maximizes information. And that's what I'm going to explain in a little detail now. Um, 
Firstly, though, I mean, is this just a laboratory curiosity? I mean, does this really happen in the real world? Well, the answer is yes, it does happen in the real world. Not that a source, a person speaking, um, can separate their mouth from, from, from their visual appearance. I mean, that, that cannot happen, or normally would not happen unless you're using some, some tricks. But what we've got to remember is that we're not actually sampling directly what's out there in the world. We're sampling uh, the signals that arrive in our heads, and these are noisy, these are imperfect. So it could well happen that the neural representations uh, can be different. And then we have to know that even though the neural representations are different, they come from the same source. And I'll try and explain that uh, with an example. Um, if you want to know where you are, if you're lost, you might resort to asking someone, but it's far more probable you'll whip out your iPhone and that goes off. Stop that. And the iPhone is going to tell you something like this. Um, now, there's two very important bits of information here. Firstly, it's saying, well, I think you're here. That's my best guess. That's where I think you are. And that's important because, you know, that's, that's, that's important. But the other important piece of information is, well, I'm not certain, and this is my range of uncertainty, and that, of course, depends on whether you're near tall buildings or whatever. But it is important to know that there is a certain amount of uncertainty, and then you might, you know, take in extra evidence or, or deal with it. And any instrument, whether it's made of silicon or meat, is going to have this problem, have the problem of uncertainty. And I put up there a photo of Horace Barlow, who was, look, I think if we can get these lights off, it might work better. Is that possible? Put a photo of, of Horace Barlow, who was at Cambridge at the same time as Lawrence and, and me, and he's still around, he's still at Cambridge, uh, as one of the key people to introduce the concept of noise and the concept that uh, neural systems can be noisy, and uh, uh, that's a, a, a way to to study them. So, how can we apply that to the ventriloquist effect? Well, let's say we've got the ventriloquist and his dummy here, and someone's observing <coughs> here. Now, he's going to observe the uh, puppet's lips, and there's going to be a certain amount of uncertainty associated with that, uh, just like the iPhone. And he's going to be observing, uh, and he's going to be listening to the voice coming from the ventriloquist. <coughs> And there's a certain amount of uncertainty, as it happens, there's more uncertainty. So, as far as the brain goes, I mean, these two can be absolutely overlapping. Or, putting it around the other way, you can have non-overlapping signals which did actually uh, come from the same source. So, it's not an unreasonable uh, model of what is, what is happening in the brain. And what I'm going to suggest is that the tricks that the brain uses in combining this information is is to do a weighted sum, and it's going to weight by the reliability, and the reliability goes with the inverse of this area of uncertainty here. I'll say that again in a minute. So, but I think there's a couple of lessons here. Firstly, uh, it means because you have this uncertainty, perception itself is not absolutely determined. It must be probabilistic. I mean, all you can do is say, well, I like the iPhone, I can say, well, I think it's there, but there is this range of, of uncertainty. That's all it can do. So we're dealing with probabilities. And the other problem is that we don't have direct information about the stimulus. We've got, to, we've got information about what's in our head, and from that we've got to infer where the stimulus was. In other words, what we've got to do is invert the probabilities, and the mathematics for inverting the probabilities, uh, the standard mathematics is Bayes' um, which you all know, and simply saying that the probability of uh, uh, a stimulus given, given the data uh, is going to be the sum proportional to the product of what I call the prior. Now, common that stimulus arrangement position is uh, multiplied by the data given the stimulus. And from that, and without going through all the sums, that they're actually fairly simple, but there's no need to. We can say that the best way we can, the best thing we can do in combining signals, different signals, is to do a weighted sum, a simple linear weighted sum. And how do we define the weights? Well, the weights should be proportional to the reliability, and the reliability is technically given by the inverse of the variance. In other words, what I said before, 
uh, reliability is given by the inverse of the square, that is, the area here. So it's immediately apparent that what's going to happen when we do this, because we're dealing with the square of the, of the error term rather than the error term itself, it's going to run away. So it's going to be very much like winner take all, because, you know, just look, look at here. I mean, the difference of those areas uh, is, is absolutely enormous. So uh, one sense under most conditions, it, they're going to dominate the other. And I think I've got next uh, an example. Yes, vision dominates. So we're saying under this sort of explanation, vision dominates not because it's sort of some gold standard or it's qualitatively different. It's simply got the most reliable information under the circumstances, and, and therefore we go with vision, and we assume the two are together, and we drag the auditory information into the same uh, space that we're perceiving the vision. Um, here, I'll give uh, an example of how we do the experiment. Of course, in the laboratory, you try and uh, <coughs> uh, simplify everything, and rather than dealing with what well, you can also make it more complicated later, but it's a good idea to start as simple as you can. And uh, we start with clicks and blogs and so on. So we'll have an observer watching here, um, and we'll present two stimuli. In one case, there is a, a, a sound, and, a, and then in the second, they're, they're together. So the first presentation, they're disparate, and in the second, uh, they're together. <coughs> and the question is, which was further to the right? And in doing that, uh, we have to collect, of course, a whole psychometric function. And this, again, comes down to the fact that uh, uh, vision, you can't just do it with a single measurement, because, of course, it's probabilistic, so you need a whole psychometric curve. And we do this, and we find that the psychometric curve settles around the visual standard. It's as if the auditory stimulus was not there. And this we explain completely by uh, what I mentioned before. What I mentioned before, um, namely that uh, vision dominates because it is the most reliable. But we can then say, if this is true, if it's not the case that vision is just winning because it's qualitatively better, uh, but it's winning because it is uh, uh, more reliable, we should be able to artificially uh, degrade vision like, like I'm showing here, artificially degrade vision, and we do that by blurring, and under those circumstances, we should be able to invert this, and we should be able to cause an auditory dominance. And so, just to show you the sort of stimuli we use to do this, uh, we just blur the stimuli, and I must say here, we're blurring past the point of legal blindness. I mean, these are seriously blurred stimuli, uh, and again, we've got everything else is the same, and, uh, and then what happens? We can get exactly the opposite. So this was the data we saw before, but with the highly blurred stimuli, uh, we're going with the auditory standard uh, rather than with the visual standard. Uh, and if they're somewhere in between, uh, we can find them equally weighted. So the system is, is, is using uh, both parts of both bits of information. Um, now, of course, we can get very quantitative about this and say this is the prediction that we're going to make according to the weights because we can measure all this thing, we can measure the reliability, we can calculate the weights, we can calculate the predicted uh, position where we should be seeing the stimuli and then we can measure it and finally get a very good correspondence between the prediction and the actual uh, uh, perception. It works, uh, it works very well, not only qualitatively and quantitatively, it works perfectly. And another important aspect of this is uh, that what we could probably consider um, a signature of fusion is the fact that you should actually do better when you've got two sources of information than when you've got one. You can imagine that you're doing the task by some sort of multiplexing. Sometimes you listen to the sound, sometimes you look at the, the, the picture and so on. But if you're using the information together, the uh, Bayesian prediction is that you should improve, just by this simple um, formula where, where the reliability is sum, your, your reliability should be greater uh, when um, we're presenting two cues. And the maximum improvement should occur when they're roughly similar, when the variances of the addition and audition are roughly similar. And that's exactly what we find. 
these are the normalized thresholds that normalize them all for the prediction. Uh, I sort of around about 1.4, and we find we're getting this 40%. Uh, it's a root 2 improvement, uh, which is what is being predicted here. Um, now, there is uh, a bit of debate here. Uh, a lot of people maintain, well, this is what's driving the whole fusion process. We're maximizing the uh, uh, performance. I personally think that a 40% advantage is not an enormous amount. I mean, I think what's more likely to be going on is that using a, a, a rule like the weighted average rule, you're a very flexible system. So uh, vision, in this case audio-visual, vision will normally dominate, dominate uh, go to a dark room, audition will dominate, somewhere in between, you'll get, you'll get both of them. So I think it's really a system which allows this flexibility, it allows to, uh, to use the best information on the day. And of course this means, and this is important, that the system has to have access to its own error. It must know, as we know with the iPhone, how much error it has. Uh, we must, the system must have uh, access. Now, uh, this does not work only for vision and audition. It also works with things like combined touch. Um, this is the experiment of uh, uh, Mark Ernst and uh, Martin Banks and using very similar sort of uh, techniques. For, in fact, they copied our experiment. And they did it two years before us. <laughs> 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 Uh, and I won't go through all the details, but essentially they're getting exactly the same uh, sort of performance. Okay, so uh, the signals, well, the, the conclusion of this uh, second part is that we can describe an enormous amount of uh, integration of cross-sensory signals uh, just using, just on, on the ground, so they're trying to optimize, optimize uh, the information uh, by uh, weighting reliability in, in that way. And just incidentally, I used the iPhone exa uh, example earlier. The iPhone does this too. The iPhone doesn't just have a GPS. It uses GPS, it uses uh, wireless signals, it in principle could use a lot other. And, and it chucks it all in, uh, presumably using some weighting. I don't know exactly what sort of weighting rules it uses, but it, it, very similar. Okay, so what about kids? I mean, I, I think it's, it's a reasonable question to ask. Um, uh, are kids born into the world with this capacity to integrate uh, information from different senses, or is it something that uh, is acquired uh, during the course of the development? Now, working with kids is something which normally would not occur to me. But I was very lucky, and I had a graduate student, and she's now a colleague, yeah, but in 2007 she wanted to do a project, a master's project with me, and uh, she said that she wanted to look at you know, this stuff with kids. And I said, well, you know, I mean, we, we, get a lot of, we get a lot of students, so, so it wasn't a problem. And uh, I really did not expect to get any interesting results, and uh, fortunately uh, she did, and, and it worked. So, uh, we now have the question, well, how do you go about measuring these sort of effects in children? Well, we decided uh, that audio-visual was going to be too hard. We're talking about school, school age kids, really, from six up to, um, what did we do, up to about 11 or 12. Um, so, what Ernst and, and Banks did, uh, they had this very complicated uh, phantom haptic device, uh, but that, well, it's very expensive for a start, and, and also it's, we wanted to go out into the schools, and it wasn't really appropriate to take it out into the schools. Plus the fact that the kids wouldn't really work with it. Um, fortunately, I was working with the uh, uh, Institute of Technology, uh, IIT, um, and uh, so we worked on it together to try and work out some sort of appropriate uh, virtual reality to do this. And I said, I spent the last two days sort of walking around your labs here, and I've seen an amazing amount of tools, I mean, toys, uh, uh, really impressive uh, equipment, uh, millions of dollars worth of impressive equipment. But I just want to say that we can do it too in Italy. And here we 
essentially developed a new generation of uh, child-friendly virtual reality, uh, namely a pile of plastic blocks. Now, this work, uh, look, uh, Ian Howard would appreciate it. This is, this is exactly how we do it. Okay, so you position the block, and now the kid has to look at it. As he can again, now through an expert shutter, 943 milliseconds. <laughs> <laughs> and he has to say which seem to be taller, which is the two seem to be taller. And of course we want to do this in the haptic domain, puts a hand down between trials to sort of, you know, just uncalibrate. And this is the important one, the dual modality. And here we're relying on an illusion, an illusion of it being the same object. So feeling the object behind, observing it. And if you ask whether the kid was paying attention, just look. I mean, people sometimes say, are you sure that the kids are paying attention? I mean, they're all like that. I mean, they love this task. I make a, a, a bit of a joke about it, but uh, uh, the fact is, I think testing kids, if you can have something real, like plastic blocks or something, you're going to get better data than if you do go into virtual reality. Because we've been thinking about moving this into, into some sort of more automated way. But I suspect it wouldn't work nearly as well. Okay, so how do we see whether it's working? Well, it's necessary to blur the visual stimulus, so we apply it for another grant, and we've got some onion paste to put in front of the, <laughs> the stimulus. Ian Howard would have thought of that. And, uh, uh, well, this is the data, I won't go through it, but essentially, with adults, we replicate Ernst & Banks, we get exactly the same data with this low tech. So the important question then is, what happens when we measure the kids? Now, you saw the kids, the, the, the way of measuring, um, for each kid we collect at least 40, 40, between 40 and 50 data points, we construct a psychometric curve, and this psychometric curve is going with vision. It's being moved in the direction of the visual cue. Uh, the visual, in this particular example, the visual, the visual uh, one in front, the visual block with three millimeters bigger than the standard, the one behind with three millimeters smaller than the standard. So that's exactly what the adults are doing. Vision is the most reliable, so vision is dominating. It's exactly what we're predicting, and the prediction is here. Kids don't. Now, the prediction for the kids, this is a five-year-old, the prediction is exactly the same as the adults, and that is because their ratio of reliability is the same. I mean, their vision is also better than their, uh, their haptic discrimination. However, they're not going with the cue that they should be, according to Mr. Bayes, they're going with the haptic cue. And this is quite a clear distinction. And we observe this with all of the um, all of the kids that we tested. So here are a lot of conflicts uh, and a lot of kids. Uh, with the 10-year-olds, they're following the equality line, so the Bayesian prediction and the uh, perceived size are pretty well the same. They're just clustering around this line. And we're suggesting that these points are not clustering around that line. We didn't do the analysis of variance, but I think <laughs> we can safely say that we're violating the prediction here. And by... Uh, measuring all the school classes from, uh, from first year up to uh, whatever it was, fifth year, uh, find there's a steady, oh, this, this has died. Has anyone got a, that's fine. Yeah, sure. Just had a technical stop here. Well, I get in without me. USB has three ways, don't they? Doesn't work, doesn't work. Turn it in, it does. <laughs> okay, so this was the data you saw before the five year olds. Six year olds sort of beginning to cluster around. Eight year olds are beginning to line up. Ten year olds are lined up just like the adults. So it's sort of a gradual, a gradual um, progression uh, and a roundabout, somewhere between eight and ten, uh, the kids are behaving like the. Uh, like the adults. So this thing works. 
Now, as I said before, and one of the main signatures of uh, fusion is that you're expecting an advantage. Uh, so here is uh, the visual um, thresholds which are better than the haptic thresholds. So that's why we're expecting to have a visual advantage. Here is the maximum likelihood estimate prediction or the Bayesian prediction. So it's going to be better than either of these two put together. And here is the actual data. So the actual data not only goes, uh, uh, doesn't show an improvement, uh, but actually goes with the worst of the two. So it's sort of, a, if you like, a lose the track ball. So not only uh, they're not using uh, the haptic information to guide the perception, uh, the, also the thresholds are being limited by the, the worst information that we have So, is it always the case then uh, that um, vision is going to dominate, uh, haptic touch is always going to dominate vision for the kids? And we thought about this, and in fact, we were giving a talk in Sydney, and, and Bart Anderson suggested, well, what if you use something more visual, like orientation? I mean, we know we've got front end orientation detectors in the primary visual cortex. Uh, maybe that uh, will give us a different uh, answer, and indeed it did. So here we go again, uh, same high tech sort of setup. Well, this is a little bit more high tech. We've got protractor and rays on it. Uh, and exactly the same, the kid has to say which of two presentations was uh, steeper than the other. And here, we're doing the orientation from the back, uh, which of course is a little bit unnatural, but it doesn't really matter. Um, and then the important one is the, uh, the conflictual one, the dual one, where you're using both bits of information. Uh, and again, there is the illusion of continuity that you're, that you're playing with the same thing. Now here, the data are quite different. Um, the 10 year old is behaving exactly like the adults, namely under these conditions, we're expecting neither to have an advantage because we've got the oblique effect for vision, haptic is, is about the same under these conditions. The five year old on the other hand have, are being driven by vision. So it's as like the, si the size, except that now, um, it's like the size in the sense that one sense is dominating the other, but it's uh, vision dominating in this case. So, again, we can uh, look at the data. Uh, these are the predictions from the adults, uh, and this is the five-year-olds, and we can look at all the data together and see that there is uh, a steady, just as there was for the haptic, steady improvement, steady improvement then school broke up. We didn't get that data, uh, but we can assume that it, it is going to be similar. So again, uh, there is uh, a, a developmental trend towards integration, uh, but when you're not integrating, when, you don't, when, when it's done, there is a difference. Uh, we can look at this in terms of weights. If we do the weights from thresholds, they're roughly the same. I mean, there's not a great difference. A threshold prediction of which is more reliable is, uh, remains roughly the same for both uh, dimensions. However, for size, we're overweighting, the kids are overweighting haptic information, uh, and for orientation, they're overweighting visual information. So, unlike adults, the children do not integrate visual and haptic signals, and this was a surprise for me. Um, for size discrimination, touch dominates, and for orientation discrimination, visual dominates, even though in both cases, uh, the position is, is, is the other way around. So, uh, the Bayesian approach is simply just not working with these young children. <laughs> Sorry, Tom. So, we tried something completely different. And for something completely different, we took inspiration from a different 18th century British version, namely uh, the uh, Reverend uh, Bishop George Barclay. And uh, George Barclay uh, wrote an essay, a very good essay, towards the youth of religion, um, around about 300 years ago. And in that, he makes a great point of saying that things like uh, distance is not automatically defined for the visual system. And in particular, that size, which requires access to distance, is not given directly by the visual system. And he claims what has been summarized as a soundbite that uh, touch educates vision. I mean, there is, it's, that's a little bit of a, uh, a summary of what he's saying. 
but he was saying that until you have had experience of uh, uh, tactile experience of an object, you cannot, uh, the visual system cannot determine its size. Size, and I think these days it would be uh, more correct to say that uh, touch calibrates vision, and that's certainly the line that uh, I want to make. So, what we believe was happening, that with, with young children, the calibration was more important because their bodies are changing continuously, the height's changing, which uh, gives different estimates of, of, of distance, so their endrocular uh, distance is changing, their limb sizes, their limbs are growing, their hand sizes, you know, all this stuff is changing. So presumably, they need to be continually calibrated, and if you're using one sense to calibrate the other, then it's, you can't really integrate them, you lose calibration. Uh, advantage if you do that. <coughs> and what we're <coughs> saying, what we would like to suggest is that whereas the rules for integration are clear, that the most reliable sense should do the uh, integration, that govern the integration, dominate the integration, uh, in the case of calibration that's not true. Uh, we're not really interested in, in uh, reliability, we're interested in accuracy. And just to remind you, uh, this is high precision or reliability, they're very similar terms, but low accuracy because uh, we're missing the target. This is low precision and there's a lot of scatter of the, of, of the errors, uh, but on average, there's no bias. On average, this system here is accurate. So if you are considering, well, what do we do? We need to recalibrate. This, is, this person is clearly the best archer, but needs recalibration. Namely, we need to shift the sights. Now, to shift the sites, uh, we should get information from here of where the target actually is. And use that to recalibrate this, and then you will have a very good system. If you use this information to recalibrate that, uh, you'll get even worse. So, I think the rules of the game for calibration are quite different from those of integration. Uh, and not much work has been done on calibration, um, but and also it's very difficult to know accuracy. Uh, Reliability or, or precision you can measure if you just look at the scatter of your data. Accuracy is a far bigger, is a far bigger problem. But putting that aside, uh, let's, uh, let's go with that and let's say that that's what we believe is happening. We're talking about cross-sensory calibration and this is getting to the third part of the talk. Um, or perhaps the fourth. fourth yes. um, we can make predictions. We can make predictions. We can make predictions that if one sense needs to calibrate the other, if that calibrating sense, the calibrator, is taken away, then the sense that should be calibrated uh, should also suffer. Uh, so we can be more specific and we can say in terms of blind children should show compromised haptic orientation thresholds. Remember there, that's when the orientation vision was dominant. And haptic disturbances should lead to compromised visual size thresholds, so if there's uh, some disturbance in the tactile uh, sensing. So that's the prediction. I've rather got rather nervous about these predictions because I mean, prediction is, is hard and I'm not used to making predictions before collecting the data. <laughs> it really is much easier afterwards. <laughs> but this time, strangely enough, we did it before. And this is the high-tech experiment again. Sound here, but it doesn't matter. Oh, I don't know what's going to sound off. It doesn't matter, it's in Italian anyway. <laughs> okay, so the same sort of thing, exactly the same that we did with the, uh, with the other. Now that was the first kid we tested, uh, a five-year-old, and lo and behold, his data are in green. This is the orientation threshold. The psychometric function is all over the place. Just couldn't do the task. Just was, was, was really bad. At it. And not that he was generically bad, uh, uh, because for the size discrimination, he was just as good as the age match by controls. The black data are the, are the data we've seen before. We used the data that we'd already corrected. Collect, and that's why we use exactly the same setup. And uh, this result generalized. Um, if we normalize the data of, of the blind kids by the age match control, so these are different ages, but they've all been normalized by their appropriate 
controls. So as they're normalized, if it's one, if they're sitting at one, it means that they're exactly the same as the controls. Uh, if they're higher than one, they're worse. So here we've got orientation is worse. And if they're lower than one, they're better. And these are the averages. So the black kids are actually better at size discrimination. And that goes with a lot of literature that blind people are better at haptic tasks, they're better at auditory tasks, and so on. And it goes with their intuitions, that they're going to compensate, they're going to attend more to the other senses, uh, there could be colonization of neural hardware that's dedicated for vision, and so on. So that goes with what we would expect, although the effects are very small, as they all are in the literature. But this enormous effect of more than a factor of two, that they cannot do the haptic orientation. And as I said, that we're predicting it's not just out of the blue. Now we can do the complement of this with a group of um, uh, dyskinetic cerebral palsy kids, and these uh, lack fine motor control. And uh, so if they're lacking fine motor control, the idea would be that they can use uh, touch to a lesser extent to calibrate, not only, uh, not only for the benefit of using touch, but also to calibrate vision. Um, so we're predicting in this case that they're going to have poorer visual thresholds, but the, sorry, poorer, poorer size thresholds, but the orientation threshold, visual orientation threshold, should be the same. Uh, and that's what we get. This is an example of one of the kids, the eight-year-old. Uh, the red is the uh, discriminated kid. Uh, much poorer, really sloppy psychometric function, and they just didn't like the time. They didn't, didn't want to do it. But, Whereas the orientation is very happy with Very, very happy with And we put the, those two together. So we've got this exactly complementary result with the blind being compromised on orientation and the dyskinetic uh, compromised on size. And that is true of all of the data. So here's all the data. Um, so size works for the dyskinetic. Uh, orientation worse for the for the blind, and interestingly, although the subject pool is unfortunately low, uh, we've got two kids here who acquired the disability around about the age of three. So um, this uh, had had access to uh, oh yeah, this was an uh, acquired dys uh, dyskinesia. Um, I think it was a stroke. I can't remember. Uh, this was a stroke uh, and acquired blindness about the age of three. So in both cases that had the use of the uh, sense, which could in principle calibrate the other, and, and these uh, are falling uh, right outside the, uh, right at the experience of the, of the group. Unfortunately, there's only one in each case, and this is something we really must get around to prioritizing, but it, it hasn't happened so far. But at least this, this very low sample is, is consistent with the, uh, with the idea that even a, certain, even a short amount of calibration is sufficient. Okay. But what about what I started with was uh, sound and, and, and vision. Can we use what happens to the blind? Um, uh, what will happen to their spatial localization? Spatial localization of sound. So we know that um, vision is more precise than audition for localizing sound. And there is a good deal of evidence I'm not going to suggest it. Show it here, including uh, Nudson, who put prisms on, on owls and showed that they get their hearing is uh, goes with the vision, and you can really muck up their hearing putting the prisms on and take them off, and they're still mucked up until they uh, until they go back and so on. So there's good reason to suspect that vision is necessary to uh, calibrate sound, even though we know uh, that the blind uh, often have uh, enhanced auditory skills. I mean, it's a wonder. His auditory skills were really rather good. Um, this is the, uh, the uh, task we chose. Now, we, I'm not even quite sure why, but we didn't just use a simple pointing task initially, although we did later, but we used a, uh, uh, a space by section. And so we had three sounds that, um, let's see if we can make that happen. So they're about like that. They're separated by half a second. And the first was at one end, the second was somewhere in the middle, the third was at the other end. All this in an AECOA chamber, 
and the subjects have to say whether the middle sound was closer to the first or closer to the second. I mean, it's just a simple uh, bisection task. Um, they can't do it. This is all the data chucked in together. Uh, I'll show you individual data in a minute. But these are the controlled, perfectly ordered psychometric function. Uh, the blind just cannot do it. Now, that is not the result of just a couple of stray subjects. Um, oh, before, before saying this, we did a control task where rather than having to do a spatial bisection, there were just two beep, beep, and have to say, well, whether the direction of motion was, auditory motion was to the left or to the right. And this is one of the standard techniques that is used for uh, assessing minimum auditory angle. And here, they're very, very similar, slightly worse, but I mean, absolutely, absolutely similar. And as I said, if we look at the individual data here, um, we can plot the individual data against minimal auditory angle. So the these are the 95% confidence limits, and they're absolutely intermingled as far as this direction goes. But here are the sighted, uh, somewhere around about 5 degrees, and the blind are three times worse. I mean, they're more than 15 degrees on average. And very often, uh, in these cases, for example, we just couldn't do the task, we couldn't even fit a supplementary function, uh, so we just arbitrarily put it at um, 25. 25 degrees, which was sort of a halfway point. Um, now, it's not the case that uh, they can't do it because, you know, the task is too difficult or something like that. Seven-year-olds can do it perfectly well, that's here, and I think these, yes, that's it. Seven-year-olds are just as good as, as, as the sighted adults. Um, and we also did other things like temporal discrimination, temporal bisection, and they can do that. So the concept is there. Also, I had a very smart um, master's student who was congenitally blind, and you know it was quite clear that she understood what was going on. It wasn't a question of, of that, um, but uh, was definitely challenged by this task. Although, actually, that's her point there. So she was actually much better than all the others, uh, but she was compared with her minimum auditory angle. The other was, was better, so we were a long way away from the, from the equality line. Um, and recently, we've done this with young children, and, and, and that's a very similar result. Okay, so this is a summary of this. Uh, we have, with blind, we have compromised uh, haptic orientation uh, discrimination thresholds. With uh, dyskinetic children, uh, they have uh, compromised the visual side, so it's exactly in the direction we expect. And also, with the adults and with children, uh, show compromised auditory space perception. Um, okay, uh, just before I close, uh, what about, we, we talk here about uh, combining various forms of um, different sensory information. What about combining sensory and motor information? What happens there? Well, for example, you may expect, and this is a prediction, uh, that paraplegics uh, who do not have uh, use of their legs might find it very hard to detect motion, particularly biological motion. Um, we know that perception and uh, learning and the motor learning are, are linked. I mean, we know that imitation is very important for learning uh, motor skills. I mean, if you, get, if, you, if you go on a ski course, you only spend most of your time just following the instructor, just do what I do sort of thing. And surprisingly, you learn dancing in, the, in front of a mirror, just sort of doing what the... So imitation is a very powerful tool. So there is very clearly a link between perception and, and motor skills. But does it go the other way? So is action important for perception? I mean, that's what we're asking here with the work with paraplegics. Um, you all know what biological motion is, but this was the, this was the task that we gave. So they have to say under various levels of noise whether the motion was to the biological walker is walking to the left or the right. And there are three examples here. So clearly walking to, it's the cutting algorithm. Add a bit more noise, add a bit more noise. But of course we don't do it that way, we do it in a, in a, in a proper psychometric, a uh, proper um, procedure intermingling the, uh, the various noise levels. And we find there is an enormous difference, a factor of three difference, between the amount of noise that the patients can, the paraplegic patients can support, and the uh, and controls. Now, 
just to be sure that it's not the case that they they just can't do a perceptual task, we also have simply mean contrast and sensitivity. And here there is very little difference. So there's they're just as good at contrast sensitivity, uh, but have a distinct uh, difference in um, biological motion. Uh, we did we measured other things too. We did a fairly extensive study. Um, so we measured what we saw there with the uh, direction discrimination of biological motion, an enormous difference factor of three, I forget, Peter or whatever it is, some, some enormous amount. We're bootstrapping the results. We also just did detection. So well, which screen, uh, what did we do with it? Yes, is the biological water on the left or on the right? And again, an enormous difference. And then this surprised us because this was going to be our control. Uh, we had the the translating walker, so you just get a frame and it slides a silhouette along and say, is it going left or is it going right? And that was going to be our control. But there, there is a much smaller difference, but it is significant. And also, when we then decided, well, we need another control, we, we, we need this uh, contrast sensitivity. Even with the contrast sensitivity, if there were motion moving, saying which direction is it going, that's compromised too. So the main effect is in biological motion, an enormous effect, factor of three, but a significant and smaller effect in, in uh, motion measured in two other ways. Um, so it looks as if uh, the absence of uh, control, the absence of leaks, is uh, impacts not only on perceiving other people walking, but in motion in general. Now, uh, of course, there is a strong temptation here to say that What's going on is these are mirror cells, you know, the mirror cells of Giacomo Rizzolati, cells which respond both when the monkey is picking up a banana and when he's watching someone else picking up a banana. And you might say, well, I'm very reluctant to go down that path because, I mean, a lot of people should said about the mirror system and, and I don't really want to. I'm not saying it's not that, but I just don't see what it really implies. Is. I'd rather be a, a little bit more generic and say that what this does show is um, that after loss of a limb, which incidentally results in atrophy of the premotor cortex after about a year, according to the available data, um, the fact that they're worse it suggests that there is shared neural circuitry. Now, I think I would go that far to say that there is shared neural circuitry for the perception and the production of an action. And that makes very good sense. I mean, that's an economy. If you've got, if you've got a module to do that, if it's going to work one way, it works the other way. It's a little bit like a, 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 a radar. When they wanted to put radars into aeroplanes uh, during the war, uh, what Sir Alan Hodgkin of Hodgkin and, and, and Huxley uh, invented was, he said, well, we don't need to have one aerial for transmitting and one aerial for receiving. We can use the same one because the reversibility of optics and so on. So you can use the same equipment for transmitting and for receiving in a, in a radar. And I think a similar thing is going on here. We're, we're taking advantage of the same neural hardware uh, for, and, and software, I, I, I guess, uh, for doing these, these two things. OK. So, pretty well done. Um, except for one core, of course. The, uh, so, it's definitely true that the signals uh, from different sensors are processed in different areas. I'm certainly not suggesting that they're not. But they are combined in an efficient and very flexible manner uh, that allows us to maximize overall performance, overall perceptual and motor performance. Um, we're not born with this skill. Uh, this takes time. Uh, and uh, um, children do not show the same sort of flexible and efficient integration across sensors. Uh, but one sense tends to dominate over the other, suggesting that the uh, cross-sensor integration needs to be learned and acquired. And we suggest that an important role is calibration. Uh, so following these predictions, we find the predictions that are accepted deficits in the blind, uh, in this kinesia, uh, and also in the And that pretty well is the end of the talk. But I just want to say one thing before stopping, and that is that it seems reasonable at this point for someone to ask and say, well, if you really understand about these interactions between sensors and so on, can you do anything to help um, the blind, for example? 
And that, I think, is an absolutely reasonable question to ask. Now, there are various uh, systems around of sensory substitution. I mean, best, I think, of the cochlear implants, but also in vision, the Ciagas II, for example, which can substitute a certain amount of, of, of vision. We're not going down that road. Um, well, in fact, I'm not doing any of this, but what Monica Gori is doing is rather than saying, well, we'll try and substitute the sense, we will substitute its role as a calibrator. And she has quite a large grant uh, from Europe called Abbey, which is audio bracelet for blind interactions. And I won't go into the details, partly because I don't know them, and partly because it's uh, uh, early stages. But uh, using sort of a very simple low-tech auditory device to help uh, blind children acquire a sense of their body, which apparently uh, is lacking, and see in some way how it can substitute as a calibrator. And the initial results are, are I think, uh, uh, reasonably promising in that work of hers. And it's, it, it does give me satisfaction, uh, firstly, to see a you know, very bright student set up her own lab and we're doing all, all, all this sort of stuff, but be able to see at least an attempt of, of using what we've learned in the, in the laboratory to uh, try and go out and, and, and help people in the real world. Um, okay, that's it. Uh, and that's it. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much. Well, we've got time for a, a few questions, if anyone has uh, some questions. James. So, Dave, a question about the last part, uh, which is really surprising, about the deficit in perception of biological motion for meditation. So, because it's so different, the, I mean, your self motion versus perceiving a third person. So, one thing that seems that would be common is the temporal frequency. So, <coughs> and when you walk, you are experiencing a certain temporal frequency and motion information that's related to your gait, and that would presumably be similar uh, to a third person. So, have you looked at temporal frequency? No, we haven't. We haven't taken this any further. I'm sure because I'm. I'm Sure, there's more work to be done there. Um, your first comment was that your own motion is quite different uh, from perceiving others. Um, there has been work done, there's a guy, uh, Antonino Castina, and he was trained people on a very weird sort of task. I think it was sort of a cycling <coughs> something out of phase or something like that. And then the people who had been trained in doing it, then we can test it and were better at perceiving that. On a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a screen. And I believe there is work, and I'm not quite sure where it's published, but you're actually better at perceiving your own biological motion than you are of your best friend or, or, or partner. And of course, you never see your own. <laughs> so where do you learn that? I mean, that, that is suggesting that you, know, you are actually learning it through a motor program rather than through a perceptual program. But you also find that there's a general deficit for motion. Yeah, that was, that, that was unexpected. That was really unexpected. Yeah. Uh, David, I noticed when you were testing blind people's uh, ability to localize auditory targets, you were using an analog yeah. chamber as one is supposed to do. But it's also thought that blind people make more use of echo than uh, sighted people do. And in particular, some blind people are able to learn to echo okay based on self generated sound. So, I wonder if that might extend your results in some way if you allow them to use the, well, the echoes and those, those alternative strategies. Uh, actually, the first experiments we did here were just in the lab in a normal chamber, and I didn't believe them. I was really, I was really worried about it. I said, well, maybe the echoes are, are putting them off, um, and got Monica to redo everything in an anechoic chamber. Uh, so, you know, just, just for those sort of reasons. So it certainly didn't help. Um, <coughs> we, we got essentially the same results in, in an ordinary structured room as, as in a curry chamber. What you're saying is absolutely true. Um, and uh, I didn't show there that other thresholds, just like pointing, you know, just point to it with a laser, they're quite good at that. But, but, what is a specific deficit of this business of knowing the first is in the middle? And what's even more strange is what we should have done, of course, was randomised the positions of the end one, because it's a bisection. We didn't. So they could have just ignored that 
and done a simple location of the middle and saying, is it more to the left? And they didn't do that. So, <laughs> it, I think it really is something about creating, well, firstly, they didn't know we weren't randomizing, so perhaps that's, that's why they didn't use it. Um, but I think it's to do with sort of creating a, a structured auditory map, and that's what they can't do. Um. Okay. What do you make of the, the age, uh, the restricted age window when you see this? Uh, I guess I was somewhat surprised at how late it was, but you could make the opposite argument too. Is there something else about the development of uh, the sensory systems that, that would lead you to believe that's a, a special window? Yes, it's, it's uh, uh, I agree, I wouldn't have expected it to happen so late. Is that what you're saying? You yeah. find it very late. Yeah, but I was sort of brought up in a, uh, a Cambridge and, and Pisa labs where Adriana Fiorentini was testing kids. And essentially, you can say contrast sensitivity is all over by nine months. And I was had the idea that a one-year-old had sort of pretty well perfect vision and was just a little bit of tampering to do around the edges. But I was very surprised that it uh, took that lot. Why eight years? I don't know. It does uh, correspond to other measures of flexibility, uh, such as, for example, they claim that immigrants, if you immigrate before eight years, they will be perfectly accentless. After eight years, they won't be, so you lose that sort of... So I, I suppose there is, there is a, some window which is being clamped down there, some sort of plasticity window uh, around about that time. These did, these did. Uh, uh, yes, and it's also true that with the stimuli that we used, I think most of the information is in the legs. Sorry? Most of the information is in the legs with the standard cutting algorithm. Well, that's true, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. really surprising. Yeah. So they would, people had normal hand writing. Yeah, and, and, and we also we looked for other correlations too, and we thought, well, maybe those were more sporting. Enough. We didn't have a big enough sample to look at. But these were generally uh, young adults who were silly enough to uh, provide uh, vestments and around flights. Oh, definitely quite, yes, 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 yes. And uh, if you're silly enough to wear ride motorbikes in flies. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, there is an enormous population of these. Uh, given that, and given that it's acquired, it might be interesting to look at how this disability develops and see if you can correlate it with uh, yeah. atrophy of yeah. uh, premotor yeah. yeah. We certainly looked at that, um, but as I said, we, we found no correlation. We were hoping we'd find one maybe with time uh, from accident, uh, but uh, there wasn't. But then again, we didn't have a big enough group, and maybe these had all had at least 12 months. So I suspect you would need uh, more recent more recent cases to find that. What I found in the literature was after 12 months they had found atrophy of the premotor cortex. I don't know how much other work is out there. That's, that's what I could find. Well, it would be very interesting to be able to make sure it happens. So you presumably yeah. have to do it. Yes, it would be interesting. Yeah. Um, certainly, emotionally in general, they, they, they must be good at it. I mean, they, maybe not sort of specifically biological emotion, but emotionally in general, you can expect Okay, uh, before we oh. pass out, I want to slip in a question of my own. I just put the slide back here to one of your data slides, and you've got a wonderful correlation with the adults, of course, but for the very young ones, for your five year olds, it's not just a random no. bunch, it actually seems to be an inverse yes. correlation. Is there some. Is, oh, yes, it is. That uh, that's, is that, no, it's, it's um, less interesting than you might think. I mean, uh, it's. So, if you're. Uh, uh, I wouldn't put size here. So, if we've got an increase, we're predicting, we're predicting an increase. Well, the reason we're predicting an increase is because uh, the visual stimuli are bigger there. Um, but when the visual stimuli are bigger, the haptic stimuli are smaller, so it goes in exactly the opposite direction. So it's not that the performance is random, 
the performance is going exactly the wrong direction. It's following oh, the it's because it's dominated by the other yes. sense. Yes. That's, that's oh, so it's what's been wrong dominated sense. by the wrong sense. Okay. Whereas here, probably what's happening is, and they're color coded for what the infants were, uh, but it's not sort of random. It's that some kids are doing one thing, some kids are doing the other. Yeah. Yeah. So, so in this uh, fusion data, you, you sort of introduced it in a Bayesian framework. Um, and then talked about reliability. And in some sense, reliability doesn't matter too much on priors and that. You'd expect a few senses uh, based on reliability. I was just wondering about the other sort of aspect of, of the Bayesian framework, the, the model of the world. That's something you might expect changes quite a bit over development, you know, the prior part. Do you, is there any role of that in, you know, when and whether well, th th yeah, uh, th th that is a good question, but we're not really getting at that. I mean, we, we as I say, we've got a Bayesian model, but really there are no primes in this yeah. sort of thing. Yeah, it's just MLB, need, right? You'd need, you'd need quite a different sort of experimental approach, and I suspect that's... And we have done other sorts of experiments and found that uh, kids will use primes for things like, for example, regression towards the mean. Uh, they will regress towards the mean, they will do so more than adults, and they do so by exactly the amount you expect them to because uh, their sensory data is worse, so they're making more use of prize because the sensory data is less reliable. Uh, so we didn't find any systematic difference there. But I mean, that's sort of another talk. I don't know. So I think I may have um, missed something. You, d you described uh, an auditory bisection task where the, um, you hear three sounds and you have to say whether the middle sound was closer to the first sound or to the yeah. third sound. And um, and you described that as spatial perception? Oh yes, because in space. They were actually always the same in time. They, they were uh, half a second apart in time. I see. But they came from different speakers. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. sorry about that. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> of course, I couldn't do the demo of it, but it may have been on the slide to an array of speakers. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That, I see. Okay, great. Then that makes sense. Cool. Um, hi. This is sort of a follow-up to Harry's question about the window in which this calibration occurs. Do you think it's that when they stop using this information to calibrate the responses, it's because they've hit the end of that window? Look, there's all sorts of possibilities. Uh, one possibility may be that before the integration begins to work well, both sensors have to sort of saturate and, and, and they're still improving. So visual and auditory uh, separately. Another possibility is, as, as the, the one I think I favour, is that uh, it's more important to use it as a calibrator so there's just not into integration. Even though also in adults you presumably have to continually calibrate but perhaps less often less you know I think there are a lot of questions open there. But I think your question is why does it suddenly switch? No idea. Why was that your question? Why is it so sudden? And and, and what's I, I think the idea of the window just sort of applies implies that they stop using the calibration. Yes, and I wouldn't like to say that they don't you know, we don't come back because I think it's a continual problem. But possibly one where your calibration sort of stays constant for longer. And, or maybe it's just got nothing to do with it. Uh, and it was just accidental. You know, there's another explanation there. But it certainly got us onto this calibration idea and the rest of the data certainly supported that. So I'm still going with the calibration. Although I will accept that it's not the only, it's not the only explanation. Yes, Carol. Yeah, thinking um, on those same, same lines with the kid. I mean, again, it's only an N, N of one for that, that kid, so it's the, the one that... Um, the acquired. Yeah, yeah, the acquired one. Um, and then also, what, depends on what kind of line is, what aspect of the vision system is it? <laughs> so these, were all, they, these were all seriously blind. I mean, they were either totally blind or, or just uh, light and dark. So, but this they was acquired no blind. blind. The acquired blind was, I think, uh, uh, a stroke. Um, I just can't remember from the case notes. But it was, it wasn't just low vision. I mean, it was yeah. blind. It yeah. was light and dark. 
or maybe not even that. Okay, there was one last question up okay. here. Um, I think you said that you haven't taken this research any further, but are you aware of anyone who's done similar uh, investigations in the context of adults with synesthesia? <laughs> but that's an interesting idea, isn't it? I think the data would mirror um, the graph you have there would be six or eight year olds, but for different reasons. Yes, I wonder what would happen when uh, people. Well, I suppose you'd have to get the right sort of synesthesia. People would hear colours or something and then see what. Yeah, yeah the right degree as well. I've, I've, I've never tackled synesthesia, and I don't know that literature well, but. Uh, okay. For anyone doing it, it sounds, a, it sounds an interesting thing. Okay, so before we thank uh, uh, Dave for this talk mm -hmm. from the time, I've got a couple of little gifts to present to you. Mm -hmm. There we go. Mm -hmm. Oh! Mm -hmm. And, best of all, a CBR t shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Reception uh, with wine and cheese and stuff over in the Behavioural Sciences Building in 163, where we usually have the, the seminars. So everyone's welcome to that, and we'll just make our way over to the BSB. Board. <laughs>